Uh, joining this legacy is Chuck Marone. He is the founder and president of Strong Towns, a leading nonprofit, barnstorming the country, advocating for models of city planning and development that allow for financially strong and resilient cities, towns, and neighborhoods. Marone is a professional engineer licensed in Minnesota. He's the real deal. He's not just spewing ideas without knowing what he's talking about. A member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and the lead author of Thoughts on Building Strong Towns, volumes one, two, and three. Um, and a world-class transportation system. Transportation is in the news these days, um, fixing subways and the like. Uh, in 2017, he was named one of the 10 most influential urbanists of all time by Plan Netizen. He has come to the Harvard Law Forum today to share what lawyers and law students can do to help advance sustainable and resilient models of urban development. Let's hear it for Chuck Marone. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm from Minnesota. We don't like grand introductions. Uh, when you get up and say, well, he's pretty good, that's like high praise. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it is an honor to be here, and I I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, beginning in the uh, early 1900s, we started to experiment with a, a different style of building and development, uh, a style that kind of percolated throughout uh, this stalled time of the Great Depression and World War II, uh, but then kicked off again with Augusto uh, after we finished the war and started to demobilize. We took that energy that we had as a country that we had used to fight a war and put it into the productive capacity of fixing the problems that we saw with American cities. Uh, when we did this at the time, it was, a, it was a, a, the beginning of a grand experiment, a really, uh, I, I think, kind of a vision consistent with what is the best of America. We're going to uh, not sit back and accept the problems that we see. We're not going to sit back and accept the inadequacies of our system. We're, we're going to go out uh, and make you know, radical change of the landscape. And that's what we did. Uh, we went out and we used our affluence, our power, uh, our capacities to reshape an entire continent, to reshape an entire continent around a new set of principles, a new way of building cities. Uh, we were out to solve problems. Uh, we ran highways through the middle of our cities. We spread things out across the landscape. Uh, we did this and we created a, a really a, a generation of growth and prosperity that has never been seen before in human history. Uh, when we look back at that today, particularly people who were uh, living at the time and lived through that, they look back at it with great fondness and prosperity. Uh, but we often don't connect those choices and those things we did now with the, the, the struggles we have today. Uh, I started writing a blog back in 2008. Uh, these few little nascent ideas that I was putting down and sharing with some friends of mine, uh, I never realized would grow to the extent that they have. Uh, today we're gonna talk about some of the financial ramifications of this big suburban experiment. Uh, and then I'm gonna try to wrap that in and talk uh, about what our our, our legal profession can do to support the kind of change that we as a society need to experience now uh, in the aftermath of this experiment. Uh, just very briefly, our organization, uh, we're a nonprofit. We do media outreach across the country to try to share this message. Our mission is to support a model of development that allows our cities to become financially strong and resilient. My good friend Joe Minicozzi is sitting here. Uh, him and I have partnered on so many things over the years. One of the things that we partnered on was a project in Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, where we went in and were asked to explain to a city why they were broke, why they lacked the money to do basic, basic things, why, despite all the oil money, despite all the investment, despite all the growth, despite all the success they had experienced, uh, they couldn't maintain even uh, you know, a fraction of the roads that they had already built. Why? Why was this? And as we started to piece through the data, things started to become very clear. We were able to tell the story. For example, uh, we looked at their population growth since World War II. Their population growth uh, was 350%, uh, three and a half times uh, between the end of World War II and, and what we were experiencing now. We had some great maps that showed the extent of their water system. And what we were able to show them is that uh, their pipes, uh, the amount of, of stuff they had on the ground, uh, had grown in that period of time by 10 times. When we looked at the hydrants that were shown on the map, we showed them that you know, your hydrants have grown, uh, the number you have has grown 21 times. As an engineer, when I look at this, 
Uh, here's what I see. You grew your population by three and a half times, but you grew your liabilities by 10 times and 20 times, right? Uh, we did, what we took is a city and we spread it out over a very large landscape. Uh, the question becomes then, what happened to our wealth? Did this actually make us wealthier? Did this actually make us richer? And what we see when we look at family wealth is that we're not keeping up. Uh, the level of liabilities that we're creating nowhere matches the wealth that is subsequently being created. Uh, what we have done at Strong Towns is gone around and, and evaluated aspects of our development pattern. I'm going to show you a few case studies right now that are very simple uh, to illustrate kind of the underlying fundamentals of what our post-World War II development pattern has involved. Uh, this is a basic dead-end cul-de-sac. It's a standard kind of development we see in, in modern America. Uh, you've got a dead-end road, houses along it, no through traffic, no commercial traffic. This road only exists to serve the people that are there. Uh, when this was built, the city went out and paid half the cost. The property owners paid the other half. We looked at the tax revenue the city collects from these property owners and said, how long is it going to take the city to recoup the amount of money that they spent to build it? The answer is 37 years. Now, the road's not going to last 37 years, but it's going to take the city that long just to break even. Of course, now this is a city liability. The city has to go out and maintain this road indefinitely, but they don't have the tax base here to do it. Here's another development. This one, uh, again, if you look, is a closed loop with a dead end cul-de-sac. There's no through traffic, no commercial traffic, no kind of white noise going on here that would complicate. This is a very just simple development. This was built in the early 1980s. The developer paid all the costs of building all the infrastructure. Of course, rolled that over into the sale price of the homes. People have been including that value in their homes for years, been paying that on their mortgage. At the same time, they've been paying taxes to the city to maintain all this stuff. The road fell apart. The city went out and fixed it. The cost was $354,000. We asked the question, based on the tax revenue the city collects from the people who live within this development, the only people who use this road in any substantive way, how long is it going to take the city to recoup the money they just spent fixing that road? The answer is 79 years. The road won't last anywhere near that long. So we said, OK, what if the city wanted to collect between now and the time the road fell apart enough money to actually go out and fix it? What would that mean? It would mean an immediate 46% increase in taxes with annual increases of 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years with all that money going just to maintain the roadway. The sewer, the water, the storm sewer, all of that are vastly more expensive. <clears throat> now, sometimes people say, OK, Chuck, we get it. We know we lose money on residential. We make it up on commercial. Commercial is where our cash is. To which you know, my response is, I don't know any corporation that loses money on 90% of what it does and tries to make it up on the last 10%. I don't know why an incorporated municipality would think that was a successful business strategy. Nonetheless, we have aligned and created our development pattern to do exactly that. So here is a business park. This is one of those build it and they will come investments that cities like to do. We'll go put out uh, the deep pipe, the wide streets, we'll create shovel ready lots. And when the next Google comes trolling through town or whoever it is, we'll have a nice place for them to land. This is a strategy cities all over the country, big and small, use. This one was built in the mid-1990s. It is so successful, every single lot is now built upon. The city felt this was so great, we want to do the exact same thing on property we own right next door. So just repeat this on the exact same size piece of property. We asked the question, OK, if we could do the same thing and get the same amount of tax value, uh, would that be a good investment? It's $2.1 million to build this. Uh, there's $6.6 .6 million of tax base out here now. Uh, pause for a second. Of that tax base, four of the lots are a church. Two of the lots belong to the school district. It's their bus maintenance building. Uh, one of the lots is a county maintenance garage. One is a city maintenance garage. All of these are very important, right? We need churches. We need schools. We need maintenance buildings. None of them pay any taxes to the city. Of the remaining properties, the ones that theoretically would pay taxes, Every single one was given a long-term tax subsidy in order to attract them to move into the city. For the sake of our analysis, in order to make the numbers balance, because uh, this is the only way it would work, we had to assume that in our new development, every single property would be built on within 12 months of its completion by a full tax-paying, non-subsidized entity. And every penny of new revenue would go to retire that bond the city was taking on. If that were the case, it would still take the city almost three decades, 29 years, just to break even. That's three decades where everybody else's taxes would have to go up to pay 
to plow the snow, mow the ditches, provide police and fire protection, and all the other services that are needed, and that's in the most wildly optimistic scenario. In, in the early days of, of giving talks like this, I used to be so proud of our work, I would go through and do like 15 of these, and people would start to cry at some point. Uh, it just didn't, it became unnecessary, uh, because we can all grasp what's going on here very clearly, right? Let me walk you through it from a cash flow standpoint. Uh, let's say that a developer comes to our community and says, you know, I have this piece of property I would like to build upon. I am willing to, at my expense, build all the residential homes. I'm willing to build all the commercial buildings. I am willing to follow all of your rules and regulations. I'm not asking for any handouts. I'm not asking for any subsidies. I will, at my expense, pay for all the roads and the streets and the curb and the sidewalk. I'll pay for the required pipes and pumps and valves and meters. I'll pay for all that. The only thing that I ask is that when I finish making this investment in your community, that you, the public, right, the city, take on the long-term responsibility to service and maintain this. What do you think our cities would say to that? They say, absolutely, right? You're following all of our rules. You don't want any handouts. You pay for everything. Of course, this is, this is the ideal scenario. But let's say, you know, we're good, smart, prudent people. Uh, we've heard of this strong town stuff. We want to do the right thing. So when the money comes in, we take the portion that would normally get siphoned off and spent other, where, uh, other places fixing stuff, and we, we set that aside. And every year when the money comes in, we take that portion, we set it aside, and we allow it to accumulate so that when we get out of generation and we have to make good on that promise we made that we will fix and take care of all this stuff, we'll have a big pot of money to do that. Here's what that looks like. In year one, everything is brand new, hasn't cost you anything. The money comes in and you take that portion and you set it aside. In year two, you add a little bit more money. In year three, a little bit more. Year four and five and on and on and on. And you can see a five-year-old road doesn't cost you anything. A 10-year-old sidewalk doesn't cost you anything. A 15-year-old pipe isn't costing you anything. And so as you get out in time, you just have money coming in, nothing going out. You're feeling very, very rich. You get a couple decades out and you have a huge pot of money. The problem is when you get to, in this example, year 25, and you actually start to make good on those promises you made a generation ago, what you find is that the cumulative amount of money you brought in is insufficient. And from a cash flow standpoint, you run far into the negative. Now, cities aren't one development, right? Cities are a, a, a series of developments, a collection of neighborhoods. So let's say that uh, our developer comes back in a couple years after that first development and says, you know, that worked really well for you, that worked really well for me, I'd like to do a similar size development. And every other year from this point forward, uh, our developer walks in the door with a, a nice similar size development. In other words, the ideal scenario, steady, continuous growth over time. And we take that money and we set it aside and we save it uh, for the day we have to make good on all these promises we're making as we grow. This is what that looks like. In year one, you've got your first development. It pays in the entire uh, 25 years shown here. In year three, you add a second, year five, year seven, and on and on. And not only do you not have any expenses, everything's brand new, it's not costing you anything at this point, uh, but your cash starts to accelerate upwards. You're having growth upon growth upon growth. Look at how your cash starts to zoom up. And yes, when you get to year 25 and you have to make good on that promise you made way, way back in year one, you gotta spend a little bit of money, but it's not a big deal, right? You've got all the money. You, you've had all this growth. The growth creates what we call the illusion of wealth. Because as we all intuitively understand, if you lose money on every transaction, you don't make it up in volume. If you lose money over the long term on every project that you do, the further you go out in time, the more downward pressure there is on your budget. This is the answer to that question that I struggled with all those years ago. Why, why are we broke? Why don't we have any money? Why is Lafayette broke despite all this growth that they've had? Why? Why don't we have money to keep the library open, to keep firefighters employed? Why can we find millions of dollars to run a, a little shortcut around the south side of town, but we can't find a, a 500 bucks to paint a crosswalk? Why? It's because we now live way, way out here with decades and decades of accumulated promises in a development pattern that is not productive enough to actually sustain itself. I want to ask you a, a really tough question here. 
that kind of gets to, uh, I think, the essential conundrum, the predicament we find ourselves in. Do you recognize yourself in this chart here? Do you recognize your own behavior? It's funny because it's mostly college students here, and I think I, I, <laughs> at this age in my life, I was very much recognize this behavior. Um, you know, this is why people smoke, right? <laughs> this is why uh, instead of, uh, you know, going to the gym in the evening, uh, you'll sit down and have a bowl of ice cream and, and watch that TV show, right? It, it's like, uh, boy, this show is good. I like this ice cream. Uh-oh, heart disease, right? <laughs> like, who in this room is going to die from heart disease? Like, nobody, right? Nobody. That's someone 50 years from now. We, we don't recognize that, like, the small little cumulative things we do today adds up to something huge in the future. This is a human failing. Psychologists call this uh, temporal discounting. It's the natural disposition of human beings to highly value positive feedback today and to deeply discount or ignore potential negative feedback in the future. That's not a failing of the political left. It's not a failing of the political right. It's not incompetent governments. It's not greedy corporations that has caused this. This is a human flaw that we all share. We, we just got through uh, one of the crazier, uh, I'm 44, one of the crazier election cycles of my life uh, at, at the federal level. Uh, I think we'll all agree that our last presidential election was a, a little bit extra batty, right? Um, and I'm gonna say something now, uh, and I want you, if you know in your heart that you are like a hyper-partisan person, uh, I want you to do me a favor and for the next 60 seconds, just really focus hard on dialing that down to zero and listen to what I'm gonna say, uh, not in a, in a partisan way. When I look back at our last election, here's what I see. I see two 70-year-old candidates looking back at the best moments of their lives and explaining to us how they could recreate that. Whether that great moment was uh, blue-collar jobs and Ozzie and Harriet families, or whether that great moment was a government that could do large programs and expand entitlements. Whatever your vision of what greatness was, it was looking back at a point in America when we were able to do that. When is that point? Where's that point on this map? It's right there, right? That's where it was. That's when we did all those things. It was right there, the peak of that illusion of wealth. We don't live there anymore. We live way, way, way out here. Way out here, a completely different world. Obviously, there's some huge implications to all this, right? The way we grow makes us poorer. When you hear people say we need to spend more on infrastructure, when you see people say we need to invest in growth, when you see people say, uh, you know, we need to get out there and, and, and just suck it up and do these things, understand that the more we spend on infrastructure in the way we're building today, the poorer we become. We become poorer the more we do this. Our cities right now are being forced to absorb the cost of their own development pattern. They're being forced, if they want the road maintained, they have to fix it. If they want that pipe repaired, that money is gonna to have to come locally. These are insane amounts of money. We were in, in Mashpee uh, down in Cape Cod uh, earlier this week. Uh, they have a $300 million project they're looking at to fix the water problem that their sewage caused. That's over $80,000 for a family of four. It's an insane amount of money. You know what their plan for that is? They're gonna to go to the state capitol and ask them to pay for it. They're gonna to go to Washington DC and ask them to pay for it. We told them, like, you, you, they, think of the optics of like one of the most affluent places in the entire country and one of like the most successful states in the country right now, going to Washington DC and asking Arkansas and Mississippi and Wyoming uh, to pay for your sewer system because you wrecked your groundwater. That's one small part of this country. This is magnified everywhere. We cannot fix this stuff in the current pattern of development without some astoundingly large tax increases and or some devastatingly large cuts in services. And by cuts in services, I don't mean, uh, you know, we'll trim this program here and we'll trim this program back here and we'll, we'll do this. No, I mean, that pipe just went bad in that neighborhood. We're not gonna replace it. That road needs to be fixed in that subject. We're not gonna fix it. 
That pump went out, we don't have the money to replace it. This is the debate we're having everywhere across this country, at every level of government. How big is the tax increase gonna be? Who's gonna pay for it? How deep is the service cut gonna be? And where is that gonna be felt? It's critical in this room today that you see the third variable in the sentence. The third variable being the current pattern of development. As long as we build places that are financially unproductive, there is no amount of tax increase, there is no amount of service cut that will fix that. As long as we continue to build in an approach that gives us an illusion of wealth today in exchange for these enormous long-term liabilities, there's no way that our cities avoid default. Whether it's a hard default, like we see in places like Detroit and Stockton and San Bernardino, or whether it's a soft default, like we see in thousands of cities across this country, where they're laying off police and firefighters, uh, they're not maintaining their parks, they're putting off critical maintenance because they just don't have the money. We have to start having a conversation about how we build places that are financially productive. When we look back in history, and I'm not being nostalgic here, I'm searching for answers. When we look back in history and try to understand the underpinnings of the way we built cities before we went on this radical, crazy experiment, what we see is that cities were built around the world for thousands of years in different continents and different cultures and different latitudes everywhere in a very particular way. They were built slowly and incrementally over time. Places would start as a little series of pop-up shacks. And if we went back to the very first iteration of Cambridge, the very first iteration of Boston, what would we have seen? A little collection of pop-up shacks. And as things grew, this happens to be my hometown in central Minnesota, that every city that was ever built before this suburban experiment started just this way. And when they were built, they would incrementally expand, they would incrementally grow up, incrementally grow out, and incrementally become more intense. So after 30 years of incremental growth, in my hometown, this little street would become this street. And after another 40 years of incrementally growing, uh, continuing to replace and be reborn and reshape, grow incrementally out, incrementally up. The buildings become more intense. These two and three story wood structures would become buildings of brick and granite. We are so used today because of our affluence, because of our wealth, because of that, that matching of vision with capacity that we had after World War II in thinking that all we had to do was marshal enough to go out and we could make the change happen. We could transform things in large blocks. And when we finished them, they would be done. They would be complete. Every subdivision that we build today is built in large blocks to a finished state. There is no anticipation of a next life cycle. There's no anticipation of what comes next. There's no thought given to, will someday this single family home become a duplex, or this duplex become a quad unit, or the quad units m incrementally grow together to become a series of row houses. Will those ultimately be torn down and become tenements? None of that, none of that's part of our consciousness. When we build something today, it is done. No civilization in all of human history treated their development pattern that way. It was always treated as a series of incremental steps, growing to the next level. Think of yourself climbing up a ladder. That's what cities are. When we look at this style of development, what we see is that it has enormous, enormous productive capacity. These are two identical blocks in my hometown. They'll look similar to the places that you're from. The one on the left I've labeled old and blighted. The one on the right I've labeled shiny and new. If you look at them, you'll see they're the same area, the same amount of public infrastructure. They have the same overall cost. Everything about them is the same except for the style of development. That old and blighted block looks like this. As my city was growing incrementally out in the 1920s, this was the next increment. So these three blocks were on the far edge of town. What you're looking at here is the pop-up shack equivalent of the 1920s. So this was the cheapest building someone was going to build on the far edge of town. And had things proceeded as they had for thousands of years, what would you have expected? Ultimately, second and third stories. The buildings become more intense, more ornate. Of course, that's not what happened. What happened is we had the Depression, we had World War II, and then we just skipped right over this and started building in this new style out on the edge. These buildings have stagnated for 90 years. Two blocks over used to look just like this. We had it torn down, and now we have the new taco drive through Two lanes, lots of parking, a little bit of green space, meets all the codes, all the ordinances. Everybody was thrilled to get this transaction. Here's what nobody bothered to look at. 
That old blighted rundown block has a total value of 1.1 million. That shiny and new, the same size area, the same amount of public infrastructure, the same everything, just a different style of development is only worth $800,000. Understand what you're looking at. You're looking at the traditional pattern of development, the way we built cities incrementally over time for thousands of years around the world. You're looking at that in its infancy after 90 years of neglect and it still outperforms by a wide margin the stuff we build brand new today. And everybody in this room knows what's gonna to happen to that taco place in 20 years, right? It'll be a used car lot, there'll be a new taco place up the road. 10 years later, we'll be boarded up, we'll be trying to get some type of tax subsidy to get it torn down and redeveloped, right? We've all seen this happen, we've all experienced this. This is a very uh, like defined part of the American development pattern. In fact, here's what's happened in the period of time since this was built. The city now collects 78% more taxes from that old, rundown, junky block than that one that's shiny and new. This is what we do in the middle of our cities. We do the same thing out on the edge. This is our biggest big box store. This is our most valuable piece of property in the area. There's a double-sized big box, auto dealership, gas station. It's a 20-acre piece of property. When these people show up at the meeting, we just stop the meeting and ask them, you know, what do you need, right? Here's 20 acres of our core downtown. Uh, just for some reference, if you've ever seen the movie Fargo, uh, you've seen a not so flattering, but not so inaccurate portrayal of my hometown. Uh, this place really struggles for investment. Uh, we've not built anything new in my life. We've torn down a lot of buildings for parking lots. Some have burned down. Uh, most of the second and third stories are unoccupied. It's a, it's a place that struggles for investment. When we look out at the best and the best on the edge, what we see is a total value of 600,000 an acre, a huge sum of money in one piece of property. But when we switch over to the 20 acres in the downtown, the same size area, just a different approach to building, uh, what we see is a value that's 78% greater. What happens when that, that, that big box store goes out of business? Someday it will, right? Uh, whether it's five years from now or 50 years from now, that, that, that will no longer be the use of that building. What, what happens then? What comes next? Well, we've all seen these buildings go through this transition, right? Whatever comes next, uh, if it's a church or a warehouse or a Salvation Army or what have you, the one thing that we absolutely know for sure is that whatever comes next will be lower on the economic food chain than what is there now. This is the peak. That's the peak. There are 134 different properties in that core downtown. What happens when one of them loses a tenant? Someone goes out of business. What happens when uh, we figure that we have uh, too much retail and not enough office, or too much office and not enough residential? Well, you all know these buildings are highly flexible. They're very adaptable. There's a reason why our ancestors, and I use that in the largest possible sense of the term, around the world for thousands of years, there's a reason why humans built in this way. It is flexible, it is adaptable, you don't have to be able to predict the future, and financially, it is incredibly productive. I've shown you some sites, I'm gonna show you now in a large scale, uh, some of the work of my friend Joe over here. Uh, if you think of a farmer going out and, and planting seed in a field, the parts of the field that grow up the most robustly, we say that's the most productive part of the farm field, that's where you get the most bushel per acre. So Joe's team has asked a very original question, where do you get the most value per acre? Where do you have the greatest financial productivity? And I like to start with Buffalo, New York, because in, in Buffalo, New York, what we see is a city that has undergone decades of continuous decline. They have lost population every single year since World War II. It's been a steady downward trend. I happen to really like Buffalo, but Buffalo is a very difficult place. If you would move to Buffalo today, uh, you can buy a home for a dollar if you will agree to stay there for five years and fix it up. That's poor. Yet when we step back and say, where in Buffalo uh, is the wealth? Can you point to where the traditional downtown is? And not only is that core, that stuff that was built slowly and incrementally over time, not only is that a repository of wealth, despite the decline, despite the neglect, it outperforms everything else around it. Here's another uh, smaller city in upstate New York. Here's a little small town where I live. When I, when I first went to this place here, uh, they said, Chuck, we've got great stuff happening here. We've got great stuff happening here. These neighborhoods here are terrible. We've got to get some of this stuff torn down and rebuilt. And then we showed them where all their wealth was and all those poor neighborhoods. 
and all the neighborhoods where the poor people live. When we step back and we look at the American development pattern, what we see is that we've built places that are not very productive. We have spent a lot of money creating growth. What we have not created is wealth. And if you're the federal government, growth is great because you measure success in terms of GDP. If you're the state government, growth is great because you measure success in terms of GDP. But if you are a local government, growth does nothing for you. You must build wealth. You must create wealth because it's that wealth that you tax. It's that wealth that you utilize to actually care for and take care of your city. So when we look at buildings like this, a Walmart, a Kmart, 300,000 an acre, 900,000 an acre, what we see is a big shiny success, a big taxpayer in one space. But when we shift to other parts of our city, what we see is the potential that lies there. An old warehouse converted to a supper club, five million an acre. And my favorite place of all, Jimmy's Pizza, $3.4 million an acre. How many of your communities would aspire to build a Jimmy's Pizza? How many of them would put like on the front and center of their vision for the future, we want Jimmy's Pizza? Nobody, right? This feels beneath us. It feels unworthy of us, of a, of a great country and affluent people with great vision wanting to fix the world. Jimmy's Pizza feels beneath us. Yet, if you go through most of America, what you will see is that America is nothing but gaps. We experience largely our societies. When you're in a university setting, there's a different feel, but as soon as you get outside of that and you start to experience the country at 45 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, it seems like it's developed. And when you get out in those places and you experience that at two miles an hour, what you realize is that our country is nothing but an obscene bunch of gaps, huge gaps. And when you understand from an engineering standpoint what those gaps represent, they represent large amounts of capital in the ground doing nothing. Pipes, roads, sidewalks, curbs. All of a sudden, Jimmy's Pizza starts to look like an aspiration, right? We can start to fill in these gaps in ways that will create enormous amounts of wealth for us. Our challenge is humbling ourselves to see these opportunities. And I want to just point out one quick thing. Uh, if we look at the people who are employed in a place like this, and I have no problem with these people, I understand uh, their life situation. Uh, we look at the, where the capital for this type of investment starts from and, and where the profits end up is a much different thing and a much different impact on a community than these types of investments. These are the people who volunteer on the school board. These are the people who run the Little League teams. These are the people who have floats in the 4th of July parade. These are the people who hire the local attorney, hire the local accountant, advertise in the local newspaper. These are the people that make communities work. We can build wealth and make our communities more prosperous while also magnifying the good that we're doing with a shift in our approach. I want to end with this. Uh, this is a little street in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee is a, a very poor city, uh, but a city where a lot of amazing, spectacular things are going on right now. And they're largely going on because they're poor. Because they're poor, they've had to think outside the box. They've had to do things differently. They've not been shackled by uh, the things that we often are shackled by uh, in our affluence. And so here's a, a, a couple blocks that have just been neglected and in decline. Uh, some residents, fed up with it all, went out and took matters into their own hands. They work with the storefront owners to get the stores swept out. They swept up the sidewalks. They put out a couple of planters and benches. They painted their own crosswalks. They painted their own bike lanes. For one weekend, they invited businesses from around the community to just come in and open up temporarily. They didn't go get permission. They didn't go get Department of Health inspections. They figured that by the time anybody gets mad and comes to shut us down, we're gonna be gone. Anyway, so let's just go do it. And they did. They went out and they had a little party and I invited people to come in. I wasn't here for this, uh, but six months later, they brought me out here to show me what had happened. Every storefront was vacant before this. Six months later, every single one was occupied. I talked to one of the land uh, lords who said they were able to charge double the amount of rent for the last place than the first place. 
because of the increase in demand. The city has since gone out and documented 18 new businesses, 32 new jobs, $12 million of property value appreciation. Total public investment, zero, zero. We have become so obsessed with chasing the big dollar, the big project, the big thing we can land, that we have overlooked the nickels and the pennies and the dimes just laying there waiting to be picked up. We are not capable of seeing the opportunities at the micro scale because we have for so long been focused on the macro scale. And if we look at our communities, they are nothing but dripping with investment opportunities, dripping with demand. We went out into our community after uh, I got a, a little bit of pushback over the, that uh, taco thing I put together. Um, I put that together and everybody got mad at me because uh, you, uh, you don't talk outside the family, right, and point out the, the mistakes, especially since my cousin is like the head of the EDA and I got another cousin who uh, like is a manager at the taco place. So um, <laughs> the pushback I got was, well, what, what would you have done, Mr. Smarty Pants? Like, what would you have done different? And it took me a long time to get to, to struggle with that question. I finally came up with the answer. Uh, I rejected the question. Their, their question was, it had declined to the point where, what would you have done differently? When Taco John's comes and says, we want to build this, what would you have said to them? And I said, we, we, we got to stop thinking like that. We have to not accept decline as normal. What our development pattern does when we build all at once to a finished state is it bakes into itself decline. There's not enough productivity there to actually take care of and maintain it, and so we don't. And so what we see is that our neighborhoods go through a cycle where they have one generation of prosperity, one generation of hanging on, and then a dramatic, dramatic drop off. We have come to accept that as normal. Back in 2000, we had 1,100 census tracts in this country in persistent poverty. In the 2010 census, it was three times that. In the 2020 census, it is going to be way, way more. <coughs> we have baked decline into our development process, and I reject that. The way we go about dealing with this, the way we go about making our places more productive, the way we go about building wealth in 2018 and beyond is not the big splashy project, it's not the big investment we can get from Wall Street or from Washington, D.C. It's not the big tax subsidy or grant we can hand out. It's doing the little things. Putting in a, a crosswalk here, putting in a row of trees over here, uh, you know, taking care of this park. Those are the things that create wealth. Those are the small little investments that actually have a payback. I went to my city engineer and I said, you know, uh, I think you could use a sidewalk here. You know what his response was? Why would you say that? Why would you say that? We're so focused on that dollar that we're overlooking the pennies, nickels, and dimes, the little opportunities just waiting there. And if we can humble ourselves to go out and observe where people struggle in our communities, if we can observe those little things, if we can shift our focus not upward but downward, if we can humble ourselves uh, to recognize those investments in our communities, not only can we make the highest returning public investments we possibly can, not only can we grow our cities to be wealthy and strong once again, but we cannot help in the process but improve people's lives. And that's why we're here. Let me uh, say two things about the legal profession. Because I have been out doing work in cities for, for many, many years. And the last you know, six, seven, I've, I've been out on the road trying to share this message. And I, I, will, I will say uh, there are a lot of people in the legal profession who are incredibly helpful. They don't often wind up in city government. They don't often wind up working for city government. City government work is often very unglamorous kind of work. Uh, and I don't know what all of you look at as being glamorous work, what you all aspire to. Uh, I never dreamt of being an attorney, so I never went through that, that mental matrix in my mind of what would I like to do. Um, but we seem to have an, an abundance of uh, legal counsel at the municipal level uh, that is very, very worried about uh, cities being sued. And worried about it to the point where uh, 
we actually have a, 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 a critical level of inaction. And let me explain how this works from my standpoint. Uh, I'll give you a, a very specific example. In my hometown, we went out and we have the school district about to make a couple hundred million dollar investment in neighborhood schools and schools around the community. And one of the things they want to do is buy up huge blocks so they can create surface parking lots. We went out and studied it. And what we found is that during the school day and all, basically all the time, we have an abundance of on-street parking. We have a, not an abundance, an excessive abundance of on-street parking. In other words, we could park everybody who would ever go to the school and they would never on the street in existing spots and they would never have to walk more than a block and a half. I, I know that sounds crazy living here. In most of the country, that is actually the case. Uh, an overabundance of parking. So what we did as a policy thing, and these are planners, engineers, people doing policy work, we went to the city, uh, we worked through this with the planning commission and the city council, and we said like, look, we have this problem, we can't lose our tax base, we need to keep that. We have spent tens of millions of dollars building on-street parking that is unused today. Let's make use of that before we do this. Let's change our ordinance to basically not allow the surface parking thing. And we had a general consensus and we got to the end and who raised their hand? The city attorney. And he said, I don't know if I can defend this. I don't know if they come in and want to build this that, that I can go and, you know, and, and, and we probed. And the reason was because other cities weren't doing it this way. He was not aware of any other city that had done this. I get that. This is the way the engineering profession is wired too. If someone else has done it, then I can feel confident that I can do it. If a judge approves something here, you can point to that and prove it here. I, I get how these professions work. But here's the thing. We're in this position where no society has ever been. We started this experiment 70 years ago. We're now dealing with the ramifications and the side effects. No society has ever had to essentially rebuild and recreate themselves at the scale that we have. We need to innovate. We need to innovate. And that means that the legal advice we get has to shift from being, don't do that because I'll have a hard time uh, you know, uh, defending it if you're sued, to here is how you do this to make it the most legally defensible. And that, for you sitting here, that may not sound like a subtle shift. For me, that is a monstrous shift. When I run into legal counsel who says, okay, I see what you want to do. Here are the three things you need to document so that I can defend it. Now we've won. Now we've won. We rarely get that advice. We almost always get the other. I don't know somebody else has done this. I've not experienced this before. I'm not prepared to defend this. It's scary to me. And if it's scary to me, don't do it. So we need our legal counsel to become conversant in the problems that our cities face and then be part of those solutions. Here are the things you need to do so that I can defend the policy action you want to take. And if we could do that, I would be so, so grateful. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We've left like a little bit of time. If someone has a question or something they want to talk about, I'm happy to do that. But I just want to say thank you very much. Let's hear it for Chuck.